Welcome to this That Slender special presentation. Maya Weavers, Envy in Times of Struggle and Hope, Challenges of Working Collectively in Chiapas, Mexico. Featuring Christine Eber, Professor Emerita, Department of Anthropology, New Mexico State University. She is also director of the nonprofit organization Weaving for Justice. Thanks so much, Jim, for inviting me and all of you for coming tonight. My um, first slide, Jim helped actually create, and it's based on a photograph by my friend Bill Jungles, who has been accompanying weavers along with me over the decades in San Pedro Chanalo. My advocacy work with weaving collectives in Chiapas began in 1987 when I was living with Flor de Margarita Perez Perez and her husband Antonio in a community of Chanalo. Margarita was a weaver, although I was studying women's experiences with their own and others' ritual and problem drinking. And um, she and her husband didn't drink, but they were a, a generous family willing to let me live with them. And, and from their home, I went out to learn from other women and their families. But sitting beside Margarita, um, working on Sotzil and talking to her about women's lives, I learned um, a lot about weaving. And, and in fact, at one point early on in my work there, I asked her, do you think I made a mistake studying drinking instead of weaving? And she said, no, 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 you did the right thing. To study drinking, all you have to do is get drunk once and you know what it's all about. <laughs> but she said to study weaving, you would have to live with us for many years. You would have to learn to be a weaver. And um, she knew, of course, that that wasn't a possibility for me. Um, before I returned to Buffalo in 1989 from living there and studying with Margarita and other women, I asked her what I could give back to her and the women in her community and for all that they had done for me. And she responded um, without a, 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 a breath and said, oh, please help us sell our weavings in fair markets in the United States. I, this was at the time of the debt crisis in Mexico and the government was paying back its um, international debt by cutting public works projects and subsidies to farmers. And this meant that working on building roads and, and other projects like that weren't available to supplement semi-subsistence farming. So people were producing whatever they could and weaving to sell in order to make enough money to buy the food that they couldn't produce. With um, what Margarita requested of me, she gave me a cargo, which is a form of community service. And some cargos are short um, term, perhaps, perhaps just a year when you're the leader of a fiesta or um, in township governance. And some are lifelong, like being a healer, a nilol, or a midwife, a nektum. I kind of interpreted my cargo that she gave me to be lifelong. And um, this has been a way for me to bridge their world and my world here and, and to make my community um, one that includes both places. After I returned to Buffalo in 1989, friends helped me in the Latin American solidarity community there to um, sell the weavings by asking people to um, pay in advance so that the women could buy the threads and then make the weavings and send them to us. I taught it in Connecticut at Central Connecticut State for a while and students and friends there helped me sell weavings as well. And finally, I arrived in, in Buffalo and came to teach, at, I'm sorry, in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and came to teach at um, New Mexico State University. At this was a year, or just not quite a year after the Zapatista uprising. Many of my students were very interested in the Zapatistas and learning from them. And the community was very supportive of the people who were involved in um, really trying to live under tremendous stress with the low intensity war that the um, Mexican government started after the Zapatista uprising. So we had fundraisers to raise money for refugees and displaced people and we um, sold for the weaving collectives. This is a group of women in front of a store we've had in Las Cruces for a few years. Um, due to the kindness of the gallery owner, Patricia, Patricia Gallegos, we had a little store called La Frontera, 
where we sold for women's cooperatives in Juarez and Palomas, as well as in a colonia here near Las Cruces called Chaparral. We haven't had any problems selling the beautiful wheatpeels <laughs> from Mesoamerica um, here in our region, perhaps because of our closeness to Mexico and, and the affinity many people have being Mexican American here. Um, in the early 2000s, we took a delegation to Chiapas of 11 women, and after that formed a kind of informal network of solidarity called the Las Cruces Chiapas Connection. Um, later on, we changed our name to Weaving for Justice in 2012. And by that time, a friend of ours had helped us establish a 501c3 um, organization, art and cultural organization. Jean Burks had moved out of the um, area for a while, but she has since come back, and we became the main cultural project, art and cultural project of that organization. It's enabled us to receive donations and also to write grants, and we sustain ourselves as an all-volunteer group to memberships, and people can join us um, for as little as $15 a year. Um, we have a steering committee of nine women, and also we have women and men volunteers over 15 or so who help us with all kinds of aspects of our work. These are two of our steering committee members, um, Patricia Gonzalez and Christy Smith, and one of our customers out in the parking lot of another store we had on Loman Avenue. At that time, it was the pandemic. And during the pandemic, in fact, we had to abandon our face-to-face -face sales and depend on Instagram, which was something new for us, but it ended up being really helpful to giving work to the women and continuing to sell their weavings during these really difficult years we've all, all been through. Um, we also have a mission to assist Maya youth to go on school past sixth grade. And our work in this um, program is with the Maya Educational Foundation based in Cape Cod. And we sell donated textiles that people donate to us after they feel they no longer want them and would like to turn them into something um, worthwhile. So we sell those at our monthly sales we have and also at a yearly fundraiser and in the, in the Days of the Dead at the University Museum here in Las Cruces. So if any of you have any old textiles that you no longer would like from all of Latin America, please um, contact me and we're delighted to receive them from you. We, for we've been doing this for eight years and have over I received over 2,500 textiles and other artifacts and um, various tourist items and other things. Our mission is mainly to help the weavers stay on their land, in their collectives, and not be forced to migrate. And of course, carry on their important cultural traditions of backstrap weaving and embroidery. Our structure is some um, non-hierarchical and pretty much based on our friendships with one another. That has been very strengthening to all of us. There is a downship, downside of the friendship model, however, in that um, it, personal relationships are harder to transfer and to sustain, and people can be prone to flows of commitment and also getting your feelings heard, envy even. But we are committed in our group to sustaining our network of solidarity with the weavers and the collectives in Chiapas. We, um, we are inspired by them and their efforts to try to abolish the local and global systems that put profit over people and that would bend everyone to the will of those in power. Um, please um, check out the chat room for more um, resources about our work and our website is on there as, as well. We have an email list and if you email me, we um, have a monthly newsletter that we send out called Solidarity in the Times of Struggle and Hope. We just changed it from times Solidarity in the Times of COVID because we feel maybe we can move into another period, although we're still in a time of struggle for sure. I'm going to move now to the township of San Pedro Chanalo in the Highlands of Chiapas, where I began my field work in anthropology in 1987. Um, this is the land, um, lands like this, are the lands where orig the original peoples of Chiapas were, were shunted to when the Spanish invaded and took the more fertile lands. Men have been farming this land, um, fulfilling their roles as Batibinik, um, true men, raising corn, beans, and squash, and other crops 
women have been transforming that food into um, meals for the family and have been fulfilling their roles as Batsi aunts um, to women through also their weaving and household management and child rearing. The next slide shows the Cabasera in Chenelo, the head town with the Church of St. Peter, their patron saint in the center of the township. Again, these are photos from my early years in the in field work. Three crosses that dot the landscape in Chapas communities. These are replicas of the Maya world tree through um, down which um, Sun, the ancient Maya deity, as well as the rulers when they died, came, went down through the veins of the world tree, the ancient Seba tree, into the underworld, mediating the three levels, levels of the universe, the underworld, the middle world, and the upper world, to once again renew the world and bring light and, and sun and rain and all the things that people need to keep the world in flower. The Maya weavers keep the world in flower um, resplendently through their textiles. And this is a Maya um, cosmogram image, one of many renditions that they make. This one shows the three levels of the universe through the colors, black and magenta and blue. Um, moving on here, I um, began to learn about drinking through one of my friends there, Maria, who was a chicha seller in the Cabecera. She um, introduced me to many healers who use rum in their healings and also help people stop drinking when they feel that it's become a problem. Maria was the May El Perez, or the wife of the standard bearer of the Feast of St. Peter in 1987 in June. And she was very brave and generous in allowing me to accompany her during the fiesta so I could learn about women's ritual roles. Here she is dressed in her ceremonial repeal and ceremonial shawl. She is standing in the center of a, an array of Maya cosmograms. And there she is in a position of power. As the world tree, she would be ascending it to go up into heaven to be able to talk to the, the deities there and petition on the behalf of people for their welfare. When she left this cargo, she told me that she felt like she was the leaf of the, the world tree and leaving it and losing her connection to that. So, but while she was there in that role, it was tremendously empowering to her. This is the Seba tree, a photo I took near the archeological site of Tonila. Here is another, as a healer, her name is Manuela, drinking rum out of her little cup. She has um, sprinkled the rum on pine boughs to come wreck the uh, forces of evil that may have um, caused someone to become sick through the envy of others, principally. These men have just left the chapel of Santa Cruz, Holy Cross, which is another pagan saint in Chenelo. And it is actually said that um, Santa Cruz has the capacity to both help and hurt people. So one can go there if one is envious of someone and wants something bad to befall them. Well, people everywhere envy others if they have more than they have. In societies with scarce resources, it's really a problem at times and measures must be taken so that no one takes more than their share. And if that happens, um, healings can help breach that discord. This is another healer who actually uses, um, uses um, sodas instead of posh or rum to do her healings. She was a member at that time of the Word of God movement, a progressive Catholic movement in which people um, critique problem drinking. She's holding a picture of one of my loved ones and my my um, tape recorder. She's praying for my loved one so she, that she can stop um, having problems with alcohol and drugs. Harmonious relationships are um, really important, as I mentioned, in these communities. In the 80s, um, it really depended a lot on people acting humbly and respectfully and not taking more than their share of the resources. When someone bought a TV at that time, they covered it with a cloth, a brocaded cloth usually, so that they wouldn't draw attention and 
and be accused of trying to be better than other people. However, with increased migration, as you can imagine, people have acquired a lot of goods in Chenalo, like trucks and have built big homes sometimes. So inequality has become an accepted part of life, but it is still um, difficult for people to adapt to this um, inequality, which was never really a part of the fabric of their lives. So envy continues to be a way to bring people down to others' level. I found out about envy face-to-face -face in the home of my compadres, Margarita and Antonio. And on this night when I took this picture, Antonio was praying to counteract envy against the family for, from my presence. I um, didn't want to believe it at first, but I should have been prepared for it. But this brought it home to me. I heard him praying from the other room where I was in a very husky voice in Sotzio. And then I asked his wife, Margarita, what is he doing? And she said, well, people have been envying us and he's praying to counteract the envy. So I um, found out about some of the rumors after that. And one of them was a woman who had visited a neighbor and saw me drawing with a pitograph, a technical pen. And I was often doing that when I didn't understand everything people were saying in Sotzil. She started a rumor that I was manufacturing money and enriching the family. And I believe that possibly she didn't have much money in her life and even bartered a lot for what she needed. So she didn't know how money was made and imagined that I was making it. That was a metaphor though, for the fact that I was bringing money into this family by paying Margarita for transcribing interviews. And I was bringing food from the city when I came back to the home, meat that other people rarely had, et cetera. The um, couple became involved in the Word of God movement, the same movement that um, the healer Margarita became involved in. I think I forgot to tell you, Margarita died. She became a, a midwife and a part of the doctor's organization in Chiapas. I just wanted to say that because she became a highly respected Elol as well as a midwife. And um, she's dearly missed by, by so many people. And this is another um, healer, Elol, Bartolo, Don Bartolo, who has passed on and is, is missed very much by his people. I show his picture, um, excuse me, I gotta go back here. Um, because um, I wanted to show you a picture of an elder who heals. And the one elder that healed the co-op store that the Catholics started in the head town was Don Manuel. And the women and men of the Catholic um, Word of God movement in Margarita's community had started a general store in the Cabaceta to try to give the people um, food that wouldn't be at prices that were maybe too much for them or to enrich the mestizos rather than the indigenous people in the area. So um, they petitioned Don Manuel, another healer, to pray the prayers against envy that was being directed at their store from people who didn't trust them and thought they were trying to get rich are prayed at night, starting at midnight and go until dawn. So we went with torches to the head town a few miles and joined the rest of the members there to pray at the main church, at the Chapel of Santa Cruz, and also at the store. Uh, collectives were something new at that time, and people just didn't know what they were all about. So the prayer was really important to these people to continue on without fear that they might get sick or, or in some way have problems. I thought I would just read for you a few passages from the prayer that Don Manuel prayed that night. I recorded the entire thing, and it's many pages long, but here is just a little bit of it. The envy can't continue, Lord, before your flowery face, your flowery countenance, Lord. Holy Syndico, Holy Jesus Christ. That's why, Lord, we ask that everything be the opposite of what it is. Let them go far away, Lord, your children that you gave birth to, that you begot, that you raised, who want to do bad. Don't let their hearts be like this forever. Always bad, always with anger, with envy in their minds and in their hearts. They always say about us, We'll see if those people make a lot of money. Please, Lord, stand up and send your power. Don't let them be provoked to do bad. Don't let them be deceived. Don't let them be idiots in their hearts or be distracted by something bad, Lord. 
Don't let the wickedness in their mouths find a place to go. Let their bad words be frozen in the wind. Let the wind take their words far away. Make the wind and the clouds walk on other paths, that they don't find your children that you gave birth to, that you begot, that are here before your flowery face, before your flowery continents. Flowery God, merciful Lord. All the wickedness that brings death, Lord, don't let it be placed on their path. Don't let them step on the wickedness. Don't let anything bad happen to them. Don't let them fall ill or death come to them, Lord. In the weaving collectives, um, that women formed, they were also influenced by the um, Word of God movement, which had been helping people analyze the roots of the injustices in their communities. And they hoped that perhaps possibly by collectivizing, they could all rise up together rather than competing for the resources. This is Margarita with two of her sisters, who were at that time members of a cooperative in San Cristobal, one of the first independent cooperatives called Snaholobio, House of the Weaver. Prior to that, only governmental cooperatives had existed. The women um, were part of a 800 members of that cooperative with their local groups in their different townships of Highland Chapas. The, um, Women were able to sell textiles there and improve their skills with the mentorship of some of the people involved in the organization, but they were not paid in a timely manner. And they were very concerned about that because they needed cash badly to supplement the farming, bring in the foods that they couldn't produce. So eventually the women decided to leave Snaholobil, but as I mentioned, and, and form their own cooperative, but as I mentioned, they. They got a great deal of support from that involvement. Here is a celebration at the home of Michael Madre where they have hung their beautiful repeals that they made, some of them in wool threads, some in cotton. And they are awaiting representatives from the cooperative store in San Cristobal to judge the weavings in a competition. And that encouraged, of course, them to keep improving their skills. These women are waiting for the representatives to, ride, to arrive, winding their threads here is um, Margarita teaching her daughter, Sinaida, how, how to prepare the threads for the loom to make a table runner that she was making at the time. Women are able to help each other's daughters as well in the cooperative and granddaughters so that there is a lot of support for young women learning to weave. The um, changes that have occurred with weaving cooperatives at, and have been continuing at that time made a big difference in women's lives because they left their homes for some of the some of them for the first time to go to San Cristobal to attend meetings or to pick up as representatives of the co-op to pick up the money for the group or to deliver weavings. Sometimes they, they had resistance from their husbands who didn't want them leaving home because women's identities were very much connected to their roles as household managers. Many women were very shy too. They didn't speak Spanish at this time. Um, only a few women did in the cooperative of um, the women in, in, that belonged to Snaholobiel. And they would even put their shawls over their mouths sometimes when they talked to me out of embarrassment. But that was usually when I was not able to understand them completely and they had to speak in Spanish. So I always felt like I heard the, col the colonial enterprise coming through their voices because they just weren't as comfortable in Spanish as they were in Sotzil. As I mentioned, um, eventually, Margarita um, and her friends in their local group left Snaholobio and formed their own group called Sobon Ansetik. They um, benefited from my efforts with people up in the US to sell their weavings through fair trade here. So they felt like they could be independent and, and continue to grow. Women also always sold their weavings in San Cristobal to store owners that respected them and gave them a decent price, although there weren't many of them. And in prior decades, it was really difficult for women to sell anything in town for a fair price. And I wanted to read just a brief passage to you from my novel, where it, um, one of the characters, Magdalena, describes how her mother, who didn't speak Spanish, had to go to San Cristobal to try to sell a blouse to get some medicine for her daughter who was sick. And she said, 
One time before the government store existed, my mother needed to sell a blouse because my little sister was very sick and the doctor at the clinic said she needed medicine. I couldn't go with her to San Cristobal because I had to stay with my sister. The owner of the store where my mother went to sell the blouse didn't speak Batico, Sotil, and mother only knew a little Spanish. The senora took the blouse from my mother and held it in her hands for a long time, inspecting the work, as if she were looking for something wrong with it. Mother just stood behind the counter waiting patiently and trying not to feel insulted. Finally, the owner said, I'm sorry, but I have several blouses like this one that I haven't sold yet, and I have to sell them before I buy another. I can't give you money for this blouse, but I have a bag, bag of apples I can trade for it. My mother just stood there in shock. In one hand, the man was hold, the woman was holding onto the blouse that had taken several weeks to weave, and in the other hand, he was holding out a bag of apples. What was my mother to do? Take the blouse back or take the bag of apples in exchange? It was late, and she would miss the bus to our community if she went to another store to try to sell the blouse. Plus, the doctor at the clinic had told my mother that my sister needed to eat food. So with the doctor's words in her head, my mother took the bag of apples and left the store without saying a word to the senora. After all her suffering, my mother didn't have any money to buy medicine for my sister or even to take the bus back to our community. So she started walking. If it weren't for the nuns who picked her up on their way to Yaptaklum, she would have had to walk in the dark through the mountains until the early hours of the morning before she arrived home. My mother told me that day was the saddest of her life. Um, thankfully, women um, have found some stores such as this one in San Cristobal, where the owner is very respectful of the women and gives them good prices for their work. But the women primarily rely on selling here in the United States where they can get dependable um, sales and, and better prices. Cooperative meetings of Sobol Azitik Women United, the group that the women formed after leaving Snaholobiel, open with prayers. This was an especially important prayer because it was prayed by one of the fathers of several co-op members to counteract any envy that might come to them for building a cooperative store, um, rather headquarters or, or meeting house. It's where they can now welcome visitors to come to their community. And he is praying here to make sure that all will go well in their new house. I thought I would um, give you just a few stanzas from another prayer, another healer prayed in a film about this cooperative made in 1998 by Judith Gleason. The film is called Prayer for the Weavers and it is on YouTube. And the healer <clears throat> said, we ask you, Lord, when they travel on the road, take care of the women, that nothing happens to them on the road, in the van. I am crossing my hands and kneeling to ask your blessing on everyone who is present, and most importantly, on the women. The story of the women artisans, Lord, we ask you to put them in the middle of your hand, of your document, of your book, that they be in the middle, Lord. Um, I think this phrasing, that they be in the middle, Lord, shows the understanding men were acquiring and everyone in their communities that these women weavers and collectives were able to bring in money to their families, to improve their homes and their welfare that they weren't able to do individually on their own. This is another meeting that is um, beginning with a prayer and Claudia, Margarita's daughter, is lighting the candles for this meeting. Claudia has since gone on to go to high school, which is unusual for young women in this community. She ended up getting a degree and was able to get a job now installing internet in Chenalo. <laughs> and this has been a great boon to her and her son and now her husband, whom she recently married. But she's continuing to weep. And I will tell you a little bit more about her later. Girls rarely go on to school though, um, without assistance, scholarships. And this is our poster at one of our fundraisers um, where we raise money for scholarships by selling donations. And these are some tourist items acquired in Mexico by one of our donors. We also sell incredibly beautiful repeals that people donate to us from all over Mesoamerica. Um, one of the young women who has benefited from this scholarship project through the Maya Educational Foundation is Brenda Paula on the right here. 
and Brenda Powell is going to high school in Chenelo. In a program that I started with the help of the Maya Educational Foundation in honor of my parents who were both teachers, um, Brenda Paula's mother, Car Carolina, went through middle school um, and I was her madrina at her graduation. Her mother didn't attend school nor did her grandmother, who was Maria, whom you met earlier in my slideshow, who was the leader of the Feast of St. Peter. But um, thankfully, many girls are going on in school now and opening up options for them in their lives. When they're gaining greater uh, um, autonomy in their lives and greater freedom through this, but many parents are loath to let their girls go to school for fear that they might be abused because many girls have to go far away to go to middle school or high school. Fortunately, um, Brenda Paula lives in the Cabecera where there is the high school. Women have also gained um, the right and the space and the power to explore their own um, capacities as women in the context of the Zapatista movement. And this is a powerful photo by Pedro Valtiera, taken um, in the late 1990s um, in Shoyeb, a refugee camp that had grown up from the displacement of people through the low intensity war of the Mexican government. The um, government looked at the Zapatistas as a threat, as terrorists, and looked at their mission there as something like um, the people are to the rebels as the lake is to the fish. And so if they could drain the lake, perhaps then they could um, get rid of the Zapatistas. It hasn't worked <laughs> because of the um, vision that people have in the Zapatista movement to make a world where everyone fits and a world where there's dignity and where there's autonomy and freedom. The um, Zapatista movement also put women's rights at the center through a set of revolutionary women's laws, which you can find on the internet, gives women the right to control their reproduction, to go on in school past sixth grade, to um, marry whomever they wish, and um, to be leaders in their community. The latter part of that agenda is very important. The Zapatista support bases, they require equal representation of women and men. It's um, a very important movement still in job, but it, it had come about to address the poverty, of course, and marginalization of the original peoples of Chiapas, and of course, of the entire nation of Mexico. But at the time in Chiapas, 55% of Mexico's hydroelectric power came from that state, but only a third of the homes had electricity. Margarita and Antonio's home didn't have electricity until into the 90s. Um, there has been a great deal of suffering over the past decades, in part because of the paramilitary's involvement with the army when the army was based in Chanalo and in other townships. The army has since withdrawn most of its troops, but the paramilitaries have um, persisted. And in fact, they committed a massacre in 1997 of 45 members of a group of Catholics committed to social justice called the Bees, Las Abejas. They um, were um, following similar paths to the Zapatistas, but did not condone the use of arms in any way. But they paid for their lives that day. They were praying for peace in a chapel, 45 men, women, and children, mostly women and children. And um, the army base nearby um, was in earshot of the gunshots, and yet they did not intervene. And the intellectual authors of that massacre are still have still not paid for those crimes. Impunity is a, a huge problem in Mexico that the people in the Zapatista movement and the Las Abejas movement are trying to address to the best of their abilities with petitions to the government and marches and all kinds of efforts. When the Zapatista community groups formed, they began to form what are called economies of solidarity. They wanted to take their economic relationships into their own hands and create um, means of surviving collectively together. This is a baking co-op that Margarita and friends of hers in the Zapatista community started. They thought it'd be nice to have rolls in the evening with their coffee, and they would typically have to buy rolls at the in the head town from a Stiso bakery so that this would keep the money in their community. Margarita also um, formed weaving cooperatives um, at that time in different communities, she helped as a kind of advisor. This is the baking co-op where I helped them bake bread one day in 1997. 
people had a lot of passion and enthusiasm at that time, and some still do. And it's been difficult, though, over the years to sustain their collective work. Oh, I did want to um, just briefly give you some words from Margarita. I'll go back to this, where she talks in her life story, <clears throat> the journey of a Sotil Maya woman, what it was like when she started one weaving collective called Shobal Kakal, Shobal Kakal, um, Light of the Day. <clears throat> it was like planting a tree. First, we planted a seedling and tended it until it grew. We watered it and waited. Our tree grew a little bit each year. We didn't expect it to bear fruit for many years. Eventually, we began to eat a little bit of the fruit from our tree, but only after many years of working hard to help it grow. With this next slide, I'm taking you to another township, um, San Andres Sacamchen de los Pobres, a Zapatista autonomous township, um, not far from Chenalo, with a township headquarters or Caracol as they call it, which is called Oventique. And there is a weaving store there, and it is the weaving cooperative Mujeres por la Dignidad that runs the store. We've been working with this co-op for many years. It's, it's had as many as 150 members, but due to the pandemic and attrition and all kinds of challenges, their numbers have diminished now to this year, it was 79, and that includes nine men. Here at the entrance to the township, you get a feel for what the Zapatistas are concerned about. Um, it says Zapatista in rebellion, here the people order and the government obeys instead of the other way around. <laughs> and it says here, according to the local and township, autonomous township authorities, tran the transit of the illegal vehicles is prohibited and robbery assaults and the sowing and trafficking and consumption of drugs. The Zapatistas have um, prohibited alcohol and drugs in their, in their movement, and believing that one must be very sober and, and um, always vigilant to be able to keep their movement strong. This township headquarters, Obantique, is full of wonderful murals, um, very colorful, some um, more, much more colorful than this. This one, though, has a wonderful saying, Viva el Trabajo Colectivo, long live collective, um, collective work. There are other um, various um, sayings that are painted on walls like this one, a people that doesn't forget its history is a people that lives in resistance and rebellion. And this is a beautiful mural uh, celebrating Zapata, whom their movement is named after, Emiliano Zapata, the revolutionary leader. <clears throat> Micaela and Andrea, two of the representatives of the Weaving Collective Mujeres por la Dignidad, Women for Dignity. They met us at the store, which wasn't open because during the pandemic, they had to keep it closed. But they gathered weavings and embroideries from women, the 79 members in different communities. It must have taken them a long time and it was a lot of hard work, but they made an appointment with us at the store to meet us, my friends, Greg and Andrea and me from Las Cruces. And inside the store, they put all the weavings on a table for us to choose the ones we would like to have them send to us in the US and to take back with us. Um, it was a wonderful afternoon with the women. <clears throat> At the end of it, I, I asked if I could give them some books I had brought with me. I had my novels translated into Spanish, When a Woman Rises. It's about a friendship between two Zapatista women. So I especially wanted Zapatista women to have it. I had done a GoFundMe campaign that, and many generous donors helped me get it print, translated and printed. So it was um, printed in San Cristobal and people could thereby go to the print shop and pick their free copies up. I wanted to challenge this um, colonial legacy that has made it so difficult for Maya people to read what's been written about them. And thankfully, I know that many people have been reading it and I have yet to spend enough time down there to find out if I've inspired them to write their own books. But that was my hope that, that they would remember, be reminded of their own creative potentials. And outside of their wonderful weaving, they could also very easily write their stories or tell their stories to others. Um, at the end of the meeting, when I asked them if they would take the books, they said, no, we, we can't receive them. And I knew pretty much what was coming, but I had hoped I wouldn't could avoid it. They said, you've got to deliver it to the Council of Good Government. 
Well, this meant that they had to convene the council members to meet me in their house. And here's a picture of the house, the Casa de la, de la Junta del Buen Gobierno, the house of the good government. And I waited, it was raining, not this very moment when I took the picture, but it was raining most of that day. So we were standing outside waiting for them to come. And um, I'm amazed at my impatience sometimes because I know that things take time, but finally they arrived and I went inside and I was so pleased. There were three women and two men and I'd almost forgotten that there would probably be women representatives, even more than men. And um, they had their masks on, but their eyes were smiling and they were very gracious in receiving the books after I gave my little speech. And, um, and that was that. But as I walked out, I did feel ashamed. I, I had forgotten that um, by insisting on formality and structure, the Zapatistas prevent individuals from benefiting from resources that are meant for all and or by taking power into their own hands. Mikael and Andrea didn't want to be in any position where they would, could be taking that, those books and not letting the whole community have access to them. It also underscored for me again, how ceremony and ritual aren't just about tradition, but they're also about collective acknowledgement of our gifts to one another. I'm, I went away um, feeling really strengthened by that encounter. This is Sobel Ansitik, members of the co-op, preparing weavings to put in a box to mail up to us in the United States. And you can um, see their, their energy here. I feel when I am with them that they show me and others that they're not just all about economic relationships, but also about the multitude of other relationships that they have fostered based on their religious experiences and cultural traditions, their language, their land. It all binds them together and makes it so that they wouldn't consider making what the neoliberal economic um, theories would say would be the rational decision to leave their land, go to the city, get a job in a factory, and become a part of the society that um, the government is trying to promote. Um, they know that they could be vulnerable losing their land. There, they at least can grow some food. And if in there, if they're in the city and they lose their job, there's no way to make any money to buy the food to feed their families. Plus, their lands and their communities are very um, in, encompassing for them, and they don't want to lose those those really important connections. So they. We, they decide to produce locally and to then sell through civil society organizations in Mexico and in other countries like, like, like um, Weaving for Justice. Um, nevertheless, women do have a lot of challenges working collectively and they have to manage a lot of stresses. And I wanted to um, talk to you about some of those now. One is definitely poverty. Um, the Zapatistas, um, require that one not take government handouts. And by that, they call themselves being in the resistance. Government handouts include tin to replace thatched roofs. This picture is of a thatched roof back in the 80s. They are not that common today. Most people replace them with carton roofs, roofs of heavy cardboard or tin. And now some people who worked in the US are have beautiful tiled roofs. So one could get though tin from the government if they took the handouts as well as water um, piped into their homes, cement for their floors, scholarships for their students, handouts of food and money. The members of the weaving collectives in the Zapatista movement <clears throat> tell us that they have felt that that made them unclean and they felt subordinated and subjected to the government. There were ties um, to all of the aid that they were given. It wasn't, they didn't feel dignified receiving it. It felt like little brothers and sisters. And it's not like our food stamps in our country or our um, social security, which are rights that we have as individuals um, to receive. And these are dignified um, gifts from our government, not really even gifts, but we receive them from our government. This is a tin roof um, near Margarita's home. I remember standing on the, on the hill uh, of her house, looking out over the valley and it was dusk and all of these um, tin roofs were shimmering in the 
and the sun sunset. And she said, you know, look at those roofs. All those people are not in the resistance. And I realized, my gosh, you really can almost identify a person by by the fact that they have a tin roof and you will know that they're not involved in the resistance. This has placed some burdens on women in the weaving collectives because um, when they are newly married, sometimes their husbands don't believe that they can support them and they will wanna have the women leave the co-op so that they can take the government handouts. On one occasion, um, one elderly woman whose husband passed on was living with her son and she had to leave Sobal Ansiti because as they put it, she was eating her son's food. He was getting government handouts and wasn't in the resistance. This was painful for the cooperative, but they felt that they had to maintain their, their principles that they had been founded upon. Um, it was really, it's really hard too, as another stress for women is um, the, the being drawn out of the fabric of their societies, having uh, being different than the other women, and especially if they have leadership roles. This places additional burdens on them. But the women wisely have a leadership model of four women taking over the tasks together as a team. And then they pass this on to four more women after three years. And they even spend a few months training the next group of women. Um, the Margarita herself has um, traveled farther than most people on paths unknown to them to the United States, to the international folk art market. That's where she is here in this picture to sell for the collectives in her community. Um, this has been something that she did as a great sacrifice. It was no big um, jerk, no big trip for her of, of fun so much as it was of helping her community. She even suffered from guilt eating food in such abundance in our country that her family and neighbors and friends never would be able to afford. So when she went home, she was relieved, but she um, did do something important for people, but suffered as a result of it because there were many rumors about her. <clears throat> I wanted to read a little piece from her life story where she starts by talking about what people used to say when I lived with her and then on, on to what was going on with her cooperative. They used to say, ah, a rich woman has come. You're making money from her. I always thought this was funny because I was a graduate student at the time and didn't have any money. <laughs> the people said many things in our culture, not just in Chenelo, but also in other townships. A person who has lots of money causes envy in people. They resent that person, that brings envy. They say, ah, that's great that that person is rich, but I'm not rich. For example, when I returned to my community from New Mexico in 2006, I asked my sister if she wanted to receive a little salary for being representative of the weaving co-op because we talked about this when I was with you, Christina. She answered, no, because the other women will envy me. When people here in my community are paid on a regular basis, it's as if they become like the teachers in the school who receive a little salary. In the past, teachers came from other townships and most of them were mestizos. Some of them didn't respect the community's rules and behave badly. Today, many, te many teachers are from Chenelo. They show respect and don't behave like they did in the past. Some even participate in the fiestas like Carnaval. When a woman travels to another town, there's a lot of criticism, lots of ridiculing. That's why women don't want to go. They don't want anyone to make fun of them or envy them. They, I always bear up under the criticism, the ridicule from my compañeras, my relatives, my countrymen and women. But it hurts me each time someone says something. Since the beginning, there has been a lot of ridicule of me, but it has calmed down. They got used to how I am. Antonio had to bear it too. At times he got angry at the ridicule, but it was my desire, no, I had to leave my community. Envy comes in chains. One person says something about another and the person who hears that comes to tell me, this person was saying something bad about you to another person and I overheard them. There are some who say, ah, that woman, let her fail. It's not good what she does. Um, other stresses that women have endured of course, are during the pandemic, um, the loss of tourism, it almost dried up in Chalpas, the um, increase in prices and the lack of work and the increasing impoverishment 
um, we tried to send food aid to the women to help them get through some of those hard times. And also paramilitary violence, as I mentioned, has continued. And added to that is drug cartel violence and threats and intimidation. There are seven cartels operating in Chiapas now. And I learned from one of the young men who had been receiving a scholarship from the Maya Educational Foundation that um, there's a cartel in his community, a true community near the Guatemalan border, which is encircling the community. He said like a corral and with them being the animals inside and they're trying to draw the men, young men off into their work as there's no other work really. And the boys who were getting scholarships, some of them have had left to join the cartel. Others have fled to the United States to find work because they felt they couldn't do anything but leave. Girls are intimidated walking on the streets to the high school. So given um, these stresses, women can feel like giving up. And I wanted to conclude just by telling you about a, a crisis in Margarita's life, which occurred last fall. I had not been to Chenelo since the pandemic began due to fear for my husband's and my welfare um, getting COVID. I did stay in constant touch on WhatsApp and the phone and, and email, but it wasn't the same, of course, of being face to face with people. People know one another and trust one another, walking on the paths together and being involved in work together. And they can never know really what a person's doing when they're far away. And they even, although they trusted me and my friends, have always known in their heart of hearts that inadvertently we might be able to do something up here that could hurt them. And I found out before I went back that I had done something inadvertently. Um, when my godson, Margarita's son, had a car accident and was paralyzed, I helped raise money with friends to um, give him an operation. And I was talking on the phone to one of his cousins who lives here or works here in the US temporarily on a visa. And um, he had donated money to his cousin too from his wages. And I was very touched by that. And we shared how much we had sent. And I made a mistake by combining the money that we had made to send to Margarita for son with monies that um, one of his brothers had, had also put into the pot. I should have not made that mistake, of course. And I realized how careful they are with every peso. So no one makes mistakes. Margarita was um, found out when her nephew called down and told everybody she had kept the money that wasn't given to her son. And the rumor spread and it was difficult to take it back even though I tried to correct it with the co-op members and with her family, the harm had been done. And it was one more way in which she felt that people didn't trust her and respect her adequately. So I um, went down there that last fall in September and stopped at her house, the first place I always go. And she was making a meal for me with tortillas and chicken soup. But before the meal, she said, Christina, I have to tell you some sad news and, and some good news too. And I said, oh, okay, what is it? You know, I she was gonna wait till after dinner, but I said, I think you better tell me now. <laughs> and she said, well, I'm going to leave Sobel and Fatigue. It's just been too difficult with the rumors and also, my son, who we are living with, and while we're helping him raise his son, he is taking money from the government. And while I'm in the resistance in my heart, um, he is not in the resistance. And I'm as good as like Manuela, who was eating her son's food. I'm eating my son's food. So with all that had happened to her all these years, and with this crisis this fall, and a diminishing faith, I think, in, in collective work, she decided to leave the co-op. She did want though to form a new co-op, but um, it was going to be difficult. And she was hoping we could help her. At the time I we were working with eight cooperatives and I didn't know if we could add another one. I needed to go home and talk to my friends in Weaving for Justice to figure out what we could do. But eventually um, we told her that we could we could try to help them. The next day I went to the meeting of the cooperative without Margarita. Her two daughters did attend though but they eventually left with their mother. The um, nephew had also accused her daughter, Claudia, of you know, taking money from the co-op to um, build a house with her husband. And I, I worry about the nephew because I think he's lonely in the United States. I think he has a drinking problem. And I, I think he just 
isn't clear about what he's doing when he's spreading rumors. At any rate, um, the meeting was very tense because of all that had happened. And it was clear by Margarita's absence that she was no longer a part of them. And yet she'd been an important intermediary between the co-op and me. We had no prayer to start the meeting the very first time ever that I've witnessed that and no meal, no ceremonial meal. Always there's been a wonderful meal of chicken soup and tortillas and rice. Um, I was kind of shocked and saddened. And at the end we did have a roll and coffee, but I have been there with my friends Andre and Greg all day without any food and with a lot of tension. And so I was quite distressed when I left. But while I was saddened, we have been working since to repair damage done to this fracture. And, and I wanted to show you a picture of the new group that Margarita just sent me last week of, um, that she has formed in her community of Sabalo. And they call themselves Luchom Holom Antitike, we, my women weavers and embroiderers. Some of them don't um, embroider a weave yet and are learning to embroider and they're hoping to add more members. This is the minimal number we would accept, but we hope that they will soon grow. Um, so it's a fairly happy ending that this group is now getting off the ground. We received their, our first box just yesterday of their textiles. And I can see um, that some of it is not that fine, but it took me many years working with the women in Sobel on Stique so we could develop products that would sell here and that they could keep up their quality high, which collectives help them do for sure, because they can get good prices. They don't have to skimp on time or on the materials. This is a picture of Sobel on Stique and looking at it now, even though we took it on the sad day and in September, it makes me really proud of this group that they've stayed together for 35 years. Um, we've been working together since the 80s and this is no small feat. It's very difficult to remain in collectives in any society and especially with the tensions that they face. Um, I have um, been asked often, you know, have the women's lives gotten better since they've been working collectives? Um, have they have the Zapatistas succeeded? And they're really difficult questions to answer, but I go back to words from my friends like Margarita, where they have said to me that um, they're not expecting change to happen soon and to be overnight, but they are looking for a transformation in their lives so that there will be a better world for their children. But they're doing this for the future generations, not for their own benefit. And I was reminded over the years of something Rebecca Solnitz said in her book called Paradise and Hell about um, civil society organizations responding to crises after disasters. And she said, if you embody what you aspire to, you have already succeeded. And I truly believe that um, that is the measure of success. These women are embodying every day of their lives, you know, their ideals and and they inspire us in Weaving for Justice to do the same. Um, I'm gonna show you a photo now, my second to last photo <laughs> of um, a tour group that came to visit the house of Sobel Anzitik, their meeting house, Casa de Artesanía in Chanelo. And this is a tour group led by Norma Schaefer who had visited with the Weavers without her tour back in March of um, last year for International Women's Day. And she wanted to bring her group, her tour group, there this year and they came February 25th and had a wonderful time with the weavers and learned a great deal about their lives and purchased some of their weavings. And, and I heard from the weavers and received many pictures from them. What a wonderful day that was for them. And Norma has said that she's gonna bring her tour back next year. I'm en ending this um, presentation with a picture of the Maya woman symbol. This is a woman with three fingers and toes um, representing the ancient Maya number for women, three, which was from the three stones that hold up the comal that they make tortillas on, like the comal you saw Margarita making tortillas on. And of course, in the um, origins of the cosmos, in the constellation Orion, there were three stones also on the um, hearth. So this is a symbol with great antiquity. However, the weavers of Sobel and Zetik and any weavers um, I have known in the community had, had no knowledge of it. I asked them over the years, 
do you have a woman symbol? Because they had a man symbol. He had four fingers and toes, but the four corners of the milpa, which is where men have their identities. And that is the ancient Maya number for men, four. They said, no, we've never seen one. And of course, I, I thought that was ironic, given that the women are the weavers. But I kind of um, um, I thought it was about a product of colonization and things of women being left behind and lost. Well, at any rate, in 1992, I believe it was, the women set up a weaving, a ceremony, ceremonial cloth called Wut Codicion, sacrificial victim for whatever reason, I don't know, they call it that. And it goes over the feast at a feast for the um, cargo holders at fiestas. It is loaned out for fiestas by women who own the cloth or keep the cloth for the community. And one of the weavers has a, had an elderly aunt who owned or held one in her home to loan to the fiesta leaders. And on it, they found a row of the woman symbol. It had been there all along, but no one had noticed it. So from then on, women began to make women's symbols, as well as so many other beautiful symbols. And I thank Jim for putting the symbol guide that Mexico Lore from a London-based um, teaching team that brings um, the cultures of Aztecs and Mayas into schools and public institutions in England put together with my help. And you can find there many of the symbols from Chenaloa and other Highland Chiapas townships. I have a blouse on today, which has the woman's symbol on it. They put it on all kinds of things, bookmarks and, um, and napkins and, and repeals. Well, thank you so much for coming and I'm happy to answer questions that any of you might have. <clears throat> well, that was really nice, Christine. <clears throat> there are only a couple questions so far in the chat. Um, Jules, dying to know what you said in your little speech to the Zapatistas. <laughs> well, I, I said to them more or less what I said to you that I have felt it's really unfair that Maya men and women can't know what outsiders who come and learn from them have written about them. And that I wanted them to be able to read what I had written. Even though it was a story, it was based on what they had taught me, the values and beliefs that were important to them as Maya people and as Zapatistas. And I also said I wanted them to be reminded of the spark of creativity that they carry within themselves so that they could also write if they had the time and, and the interest to do so. That's what I remember saying. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <clears throat> Diane is asking, do most of the collectives have patrons, such as your Las Cruces patronage of the group? Um, not really. Um, they um, are unto themselves. They're autonomous groups. And they connect to civil society organizations that they believe have their interests at heart and are in solidarity with them and their goals. And I guess you would call it good cause patrons, but that is a concept I don't think they would prove up, nor do I, because it involves a kind of a relation of inequality. And believe me, I'm aware of how horribly unequal our relationships are. Um, the poverty that they live with daily and the privileges that we experience here. But we try to transcend them by um, being friends and um, working together on solutions to problems and on marketing their weavings. So um, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's the way we conceive of our work in Weaving for Justice. And, and they conceive of us as sisters and brothers. They use, use the term hermanos and hermanas too, as well as compañeras and compañeros. Um, this, this is um, important to them that we are together in the movement, the resistance movement, trying to make a better world for everyone. Uh, <clears throat> Maya is asking, is there anywhere I could see more examples of the weaving designs. They are so interesting. And I just want to let you, everybody know that if, if you're a, uh, a member in my email list to receive the monthly issues of the Aslander, I published an article by Christine back in November, 2022. And there was probably what, 10 or 12 of the 
symbols described. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, I'm sure your book. And, well, uh, and the best source is the one I mentioned. In, uh, your source is great too, Jim, but the Mexico Lore um, website has 20 symbols with fairly lengthy descriptions in both English and Spanish. And um, much of that work of identifying those, I, I am indebted to Chip Morris, Walter Morris for his work and others who have studied designs of weavings in Chiapas. But um, we also um, have an um, Instagram site where we sell and you can see some of the images there. There are some wonderful books of Maya weaving designs with their symbols described and their meanings described. That um, Living Maya by Chip Morris, Walter Morris is one of those books and several others he's, he wrote more recently with others in Chiapas and he has since passed away but others remain carrying on his work. Hmm. <clears throat> and um, Eve said she was like to donate some Latin American textiles from her collection. Should she send you photos? directly. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> um, we're just delighted to receive them, but you don't even need to send us photos. Um, we receive pretty much anything <laughs> that um, you would like to give us that you purchased that you feel um, you no longer would like to have, but that you think would, would sell to people interested in Latin America. And it can be little um, chotskis or beautiful repeals or any number of things. We we have been able to sell them and, and make money for Maya kids to go on in school. And I'd be delighted to receive whatever you'd like to send to me. You can email me, I give you my address. We go through quite a process of inventorying and photograph photographing and pricing and even identifying every item we receive. If, if you could send us also any identification information and the dates you purchased them, who made them, if you know, any information we really appreciate. We put that on the, on the tag that we attach to every item that we receive. But um, I'm happy to re receive emails from anyone who would like to explore this with me and we're ready and waiting to receive donations. We have a team that does the inventory and the photographing and the pricing. All right. <clears throat> and Diane is wondering, can you recommend publications that follow the history of Maya weaving from pre-contact to colonial to today? Um, you know, right off my the top of my head, um, I would have to email you some sources, I think, just because I'm not able to recall titles right off the bat. But um, let me do that. If you'd like to email me, I'd be happy to help you. And uh, Diane, there, so there are so many sources. And are, are you just interested in Chiapas or also throughout Mesoamerica? Um, you want to unmute, Diane? Uh, <clears throat> she also says she loves the Mexico Lorde UK site, she uses it for her class. Oh, yes, it is wonderful. I'm so grateful to Ian Mercer for. Um, reaching out to me to put together. He also has an article on there about the woman symbol, how it was recovered that, that I wrote. It's a little bit more detailed than I gave you here tonight. All righty. And here's one new message. All right, Diane's giving me her email address <clears throat> or she's giving it out to everyone. So can... Do you see the chat and you can take down Diane's email? Yeah, I'm going in there right now. Um, it's right at the bottom. D Shaw, okay, <laughs> great. Diane Shaw, right? Okay. Right. CMU, that isn't Central Michigan University, is it? <laughs> That's um, in the town where I grew up. <laughs> I just wondering, my dad was a professor there. 
Well, I'll be in touch with, with Diane. All right. Oh, it's Carnegie Mellon University. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh. Okay. Chantel says it's a wonderful presentation. <clears throat> Jewel thank says you. thank you so much for a very heartfelt and beautiful presentation. Well, thank you all for coming. It was wonderful for me to share this all with you. <laughs> <laughs> And Annabelle Ford, the uh, famous archaeologist and researcher uh, at El Pilar in Western Belize. She's down there now setting up her field camp. Um, she says, thank you for a wonderful journey with its ups and downs. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> and um, Jules asking, do you have a retail store in Las Cruces? Um, we do, and um, it's based at a church, First Christian Church. We have a space there that we rent, and um, it's through uh, memberships that we're able to pay our rent and other costs of running our organization. And um, it's at 1809 El Paseo Road in, in Las Cruces, and we only, though, are open Tuesday evenings because we have an intern from New Mexico State University, Hasmin, helping us open it. And on Tuesday evenings. And once a month, we have an all-day sale on the third Saturday of the month. But if anyone is in our area, please come. We'd, we'd love to meet you and, and show you everything we have. We have all the donations there, as well as the cooperative textiles. So you could purchase donations as well. Do you know uh, Uribe Giovanni? A who? I'm sorry. His name's coming across, Uribe Giovanni. No. He's trying to be admitted, and this is at the end of the program, so I'm I'm hesitant to admit him because he could be a Zoom bomber. Oh, if if yeah, anybody shared this link on Twitter, Twitter has a way where people can see active Zooms at the time, and they usually come in late. And they just wreak havoc. So I'm since oh it's gosh. so late in the program, I'm not going to admit him. But um, I, William says, uh, "Oh no, this is uh, this is who using William's computer." Uh, great presentation. I had the opportunity to visit Jenna Hole a couple of times with Christine and met up with the Weavers. It was a wonderful experience. What gets me the most is that now donations of textiles go back to fund scholarships for Maya young women. Oh, this is from Elizabeth. Yeah, oh, Elizabeth yeah. is the director of the Maya Educational Foundation. Yes, My yes. And, and <laughs> we work together in this project um, to um, get the monies to the foundation so that they can send it to their um, supervisors of the different programs in Belize, Guatemala, and Chiapas. So it's benefiting my young people in three different nations. All right. And she'd like to receive the um, newsletter. Let me get. I've had about uh, six or seven people give me their email addresses. <clears throat> Is that for being placed on our email newsletter or yours? I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, at Slander. Oh, at Slander, okay, great. So that's... Um, and uh, Missy Lynn, she's out there and she encourages all to donate their collections of textiles to, to this endeavor. She did a few years ago. We're really grateful to you, Mitzi, um, and also for connecting me to Jim. I don't think I would be doing this Atlander presentation if it wasn't for Mitzi. <laughs> she connected us, although and we've never met. <laughs> There's so many of these wonderful people who donated textbooks. I've never met them except um, by email and telephone. And... Um... Let's see. Uh, Tracy also is thanking you, and she had a chance to visit Channel Ho with Norma's group a couple of weeks ago. I had yes. also read our book, 
journey of social women and it helping me to understand the visit better. Thank you. Oh, I was so glad you could go, Tracy. I don't know who you were in that group photo, but <laughs> it looked like a wonderful <laughs> group of people. <laughs> and uh, Marilyn, I saw you had your hand up earlier. Did, did you want to ask a question, unmute and ask a question? No, that was the clapping. Oh, a clapping. lot of people, you know, the reactions and, and the and the heart was for was for <laughs> Dean and her wonderful presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn. I Marilyn and I were buddies here. Um, she lived in El Paso and I live in Las Cruces, and then she moved to California. <laughs> I haven't been able to see her in a while. <laughs> and um Zoom is a great way to reconnect with people. <laughs> And let's see. Um, and to Jewel and to Belize Bruce and to Brad and Elizabeth, to Eve and to Heather, I just want to say I got your email address. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and Diane, I just got to find your name again. Diane Shaw. Does does anybody else want to unmute and say hello to Christine? I'd love to. Christine, it's Jewel. Hi. <laughs> and, yeah, I want to thank you for, I went out to Chenelo in January and uh, really thank you for setting that up. Hey, I went with Tom and... Mm -hmm. One of the things the women asked us that was very moving to me, uh, it was very practical, but also I said, well, would you like to ask us something? And they said, well, what can we do to sell more things in the United States? And I, I, I've been thinking about that a lot and I'm working on my answer, but I don't have it yet. So, <laughs> That's I, great. Well, you know, I think they would always love to work with other civil society organizations like like us if they could connect to another similar group. Sometimes we send boxes that they send us to other organizations that sell them for them in their part of the country. And that's another thing people can do to help. But they can make their own personal connections with the weavers. Um, it's just a matter of establishing a way to get the money to them. Um, uh -huh. And um and and work with them through um, WhatsApp and and as long as you've met them once at least to talk with them, um, and I can always help in my organization with any of this. I think that we're talking more about design wise, and so maybe you could talk a little bit about some of those challenges or how that's worked and, and how people get paid and all that. I'm curious if you have the time. Sure. Um, well, getting paid. We They have a bank account, each cooperative, and we transfer money from our bank account to theirs through um, a means that we've explored. And I all of a sudden, I can't think of what it's called. Um, it's very cheap, the fee to transfer money from our bank account to theirs. And it's mm -hmm. right away. It's immediate. And, we try, and then, to, we try to address the cash flow problem they originally had back in the 80s by paying mm -hmm. them um, as soon as we possibly can for everything that they send us. And we can uh -huh. do that even before we sell sometimes because of our memberships, which can temporarily cover what we haven't earned yet to pay them. Uh -huh. And um, they, as far as designs, it's been a long time of working on products that will, we hope, help them continue to carry on their ancestral techniques and designs. They haven't been ever using a sewing machine and they don't cut into the fabric. They don't tailor. And we don't ask them to do those things. We want them to continue to make products that they can do on the backstrap loom and hand sewing. And that has worked really well. We've found a whole variety of products that people want up here. Probably the most um, successful one, actually a friend, my friend Carolyn helped me in graduate school to help the women design. It was a placemat based on the um, tortilla cloth that they 
wrap their tortillas in a striped cloth. Women are actually buried with a tortilla cloth when, when they die. It's such a symbol of their lives. And they make these into placemats, replicas of the tortilla cloth, but the size of a placemat. And then they make napkins in different colors that complement the placemats with the symbols of um, their people on them, you know, from the saints to the women to the men to the toads to the cosmogram to um, so many other symbols, um, Quetzalcoatl, the plume serpent. And this um, placemat set of four that we wrap up and explain a little bit about the symbolism and the picture, we get pictures of the women too. We've made tags for the women so that people see their photo and their name, but only for the groups that want their no names known. The Zapatista, pure Zapatista groups like Mujeres por la Dignidad, they um, don't want their personal identities to be an, an issue or, or known. They, to what matters to them is the collective. So they don't ask us to make tags for them. But the other groups um, we work with are, are um, amenable to having tags. I think they know that it helps connect people to them when they can see the actual face of the person who made the product. But um, I noticed that in the box that came yesterday, from the new cooperative that Margarita helped form, that some of the products are not possibly successful and we will maybe have some trouble selling them. And I'm not sure how to handle that yet because they were coming up with new products that wouldn't compete with the ones from Sobel Antique because we couldn't have the two groups competing. So they had to come up with different products and some of them didn't work out as well as I'd hoped. So we, it's a process though, like my husband reminded me today, he saw that I was a little dismayed when I opened up the box. And he said, look, you've been working for 34 years with the other group. <laughs> you know, it took a long time to find out what will sell up here and that they will enjoy making and at a price that people can afford here. So it's definitely a work in progress, mm -hmm. working on products. And uh, Diane says she bought some felt animals from Weaving for Justice and they're very cute. <laughs> oh my God, do we have cute animals that come from a Chamula group of women who raise sheep in their township? And, and these are animals. They're, they're terrific. Oh. We sell some of these on Instagram. We're going to try to have more on Instagram soon. Um, we, were, has, we were not selling as much on Instagram for a while because we started to have more face-to-face -face sales. And yet, Instagram remains an important way for us to reach people who aren't in our area. Hmm. So. All righty. Well, with that, uh, the questions seem to have ended in the chat and nobody else is unmuted. So with that, I thank everybody for attending tonight. And uh, thank you, Christine, for a wonderful program. Open thank you, Jim. <laughs> on uh, on my way to uh, Palenque a couple different times, the Zapatistas would have the road blocked and and come over to the car window. And I, I was at first worried because I had my Canon, beautiful Canon camera on the seat next to me. But they were... I mean, they looked, you know, with the mask and rifles, they looked terrible, but they were so nice. All they wanted was a uh, 100 pesos donation, and they only did, did it in one direction. <laughs> and uh, I ended up, you know, just talking what Spanish I could and saying, I'm behind you. And, and mm -hmm. you know, it, it was all smiles as we left. So, um, yeah, yeah but those were the days. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you, thank you once again. This has been an excellent program, and I'll announce uh, the recording. Oh, thank you, Jim. Thank okay. you, Christine. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good evening, Thanks. everybody. <laughs> Thanks for viewing this Outlander video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, please consider making a donation to Weaving for Justice at www.weavingforjustice.org with hyphens between the words. To receive monthly issues of the Aslander e-magazine, contact your host, Jim Reed, at 
mayaman at bellsouth.net. Thank you from Christine Eber and yours truly, Jim Reed and the Atslander.